Hey, security peeps, we are back again with our Breaking into Cybersecurity webinar series. And I am here with my phenomenal co host, Chris Folon. Chris, say hi to everyone. Hey, everyone. And I am also here with our awesome guest for today, Antoine King. Say hi, Antoine. Hi, everyone. And I didn't introduce myself. I'm Renee Brown Small, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Magnetic Hiring, a book focused on cybersecurity recruiting. So we are here today with Antoine to talk to him about breaking into this industry. He is a part of our series of University of Maryland, University of College grads who have been doing amazing things in the workforce. Um, and he has recently broken into the industry. And we are going to kick off today by asking him, Antoine, tell us all about you. He's out, he's here in, in the Laurel, Maryland area. He's like local to us in the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia um, metro area. So we want to know all about you. We want to know why, um, you know, what you were doing prior to breaking into the industry. We want to know what made you even think about cybersecurity as a career and, you know, tell us your path to where you are today. All right. Um, hello, everyone. As she said, I'm Antoine King. Um, prior art, um, to breaking into cybersecurity, I always was in uh, the InfoSec world. Um, for the last 10 years, um, I was a system analyst. So I pretty much did all the web configs, uh, server maintenance, patching, um, all the good stuff that comes along with servers. And um, I got into like maybe the year eight, and I was so bored. I was so bored with being on call. I was so bored with patching servers to three and four in the morning. And um, I was sitting at my desk one day and it was cybersecurity week. And um, I went downstairs to a seminar and noticed um, there was an FBI agent and he gave a seminar on um, how cybersecurity was um, just changing the way that we saw things and just the different avenues in cybersecurity. And then that was my aha moment. I was like, wait, I should be doing that. I should stop playing with these servers. And it's so much more to this IT stuff than just patching servers and networks and web configurations. Um, then from there, um, I tried to just apply for jobs and I sent out maybe, it was at one time I myself to do at least resumes and five jobs a day. And then I started landing interviews, but nothing would stick. I would go through like three rounds of interviews and then people will say, well, hey, we need someone with search or we need a degree in cyber. So that motivated me to go back to school. So therefore, I found myself working two jobs, working three in the morning um, because I needed that money for school. Um, I found myself sleeping in my car some days because I just didn't have enough time to get from my part time, which I would get off at like four in the morning and had wow. to be back at work by seven. So with traffic, you know, the DMV traffic, I just had to kind of like nap in the car, change and run. And I did that for almost two years until I finally landed a breakthrough with a Road Trip Nation. Um, this is a show with PBS. They were doing a special on cybersecurity and pretty much what they did. Um, um, I tried out um, interview for the show and pretty much what happened is uh, we traveled across country and they just documented our process into breaking into cyber and we interviewed some cyber leaders and just try to share their, um, get their stories and sit down in their homes and just ask, how do I get into cyber? Like, what I, I, I remember that show. Um, that's how <laughs> Road Trip Nation. I, um, I remember watching that and being that yes. <laughs> that would be such a cool gig to go and talk to all these leaders across the country and what they do and what they like about their role and how you can follow in their footsteps. Um, that that was a very cool um, cool thing that you're on. Antoine, you said you, you broke up a little bit Thank when you. you talked about going, um, working your part-time job okay. that, you, that you were able to break into a part-time situation um, and that you were sleeping in your car at a, at a point in time because you had the full-time that you had to be at seven and then the part-time thing ended at four or vice versa. Can you, can you describe again, because I missed it, what was the part-time, um, what was the part-time role? 
Oh. Well, I was working at UPS. Um, I took the job because they had tuition reimbursement. Mm. So I was pretty much unloading packages, sorting um, boxes, and pretty much what helped me get through it and study is, um, you know, iPhones are so advanced. I would like read an divorce memo, like certain cyber stuff that I needed for class. And and then while I was unloading, listen to myself learning different cyber terms and cyber um, forensic investigation tools and stuff. And that's pretty much how I started learning and teaching myself. No, I, yeah, he's breaking up. But um, I, I think what he the, the path that he was going along yeah. is that he's using um, podcasts and audio visual visual tools on his iPhone while he was doing his uh, second job um, unloading packages and um, always learning, always growing, always listening to new things to keep his mind stimulated and growing and studying even while he was on job. Yeah, that's what it sounds like, which is which is pretty fascinating to, you know, squeeze that in. So you have your day job as a sysadmin, then your part time job. And while you're at your part time job, you are, um, you know, listening to podcasts and pretty much studying while you are and learning and absorbing while you're working, which is it's fascinating. So you are muted right now. I'm going to unmute you. Can you hear? Can you hear us? Because Antoine, you've broken up a couple times. Can you hear us clearly? No, we can't hear you now. You're muted again. <laughs> There's always technical difficulties. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, so that's, if, that's life. Yeah, that's the nature of the beast. So when we do anything live, um, if anyone has any questions, hey, Katia, hey, Lynette, I see some people on that we usually see. If anyone has any questions while we get Antoine back up and running, feel free. Um, Chris and I are hard at work getting more people into our funnel for um, this series. You know, we have more UMUC graduates, one next week, and we have two more people um, in the next couple of weeks. The job market is booming right now. I don't think I've seen a busier December. And Chris, I think you would say the same. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've seen um, both people busy. posting for roles as well as looking for roles. So it's it's been very busy. Um, so busy. But one of the things that Antoine mentioned before he, he disconnected was his previous role was all IT. Um, but he mentioned that he was doing a lot of server configs, a lot of network configs, and those types of roles. And I think um, as a cybersecurity professional, having a, a fundamental understanding of how an application works with a server or how a server functions on a network or how the different segments of a network uh, come together um, makes understanding how to secure uh, those different aspects that much easier because you know how it's working. You're, you're just not relying on a tool to do the job, but you are uh, using that experience to tie in with your ability to apply technical controls as well as applications and um, other hardware to help secure the, the network or the environment or the infrastructure. All right, I'm exactly. back. Hey, this is better. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Yes, so we were just talking about you and, and how amazing it's been, how your background, having that sysadmin background, and this is also for like network admins and network engineers, all of the folks that understand the fundamentals of how all of this stuff works makes you even more valuable as a cybersecurity professional because you know how to secure networks, you know how the intricacies of these things work. Um, you had talked about before you broke up about how many, um, you know, that you, you had been applying to different roles and you had gone through different interviews and they hadn't, they didn't stick. How many roles and how many interviews did you go through during that time when you were, um, when you were looking? Um, I know, like I set a goal for myself. So I would send out like apply for at least five jobs a day out of that. Mm -hmm. I think 
at least every other week I would get like two interviews and I constantly got told no, no, no. Either I didn't have enough experience or they would go with somebody who had the certs or they had the degree. So it was like, I didn't get valuable feedback. It's just like, no, we don't want you. And I'm just like, well, wait, <laughs> are you going to tell me why you don't want me or what should I do or where should I start? And nobody gave me that. Like I had to be okay with being told no and just kept, uh, you know, finding another door to go in. Like, okay, maybe this door isn't for me. Let me find a back door to go through or let me find a side window. So you're going to get told uh, no a lot, but you just have to be okay with it that, you know, this is just not for you. Just find another avenue, another starting point. Yeah, we hear that so often. I mean, Charles talked about it. Um, everyone that comes on this show talks about the fact that you have to be persistent and you can't let anyone tell you no. Um, or that first no, it's like, it doesn't matter. You know, you just keep going and going and going. Um, I can't remember who was on our show that talked about the fact that when she got to her 30th interview, 30, her 30th interview, she was cool as a cucumber. And it goes to show that all of those other interviews beforehand were kind of practice rounds. Yeah. You know, you look at them as practice. So you go and you learn and you get sharper and you get sharper. And when you get to the, the you know, when you get to that interview where you, where you actually get the offer, you can, you know, it's smooth sailing because you've been there, you've done it, you understand, you know your stuff. And it makes a, it makes a, um, the process, you know, going through the process, there is a pot of gold at the end of the madness. Yeah, it, so it, even now with still just interviewing or just seeking for jobs, um, what gives me the confidence is um, pretty much I had my entire life on national TV for the world to see, like they saw me cry. They saw me at my lowest point. So even now when I'm finishing an interview, I always ask, you know, you probably know if you're going to hire me and not, but if you're not, can you please at least just give me feedback exactly what are you looking for or what don't I have so that I can know? Because a lot of times when these, uh, you go in the interview, they just so straightforward. It's like, no, <laughs> or you're on a panel interview and they don't look up at you and it's kind of like they're bored. It can kind of be discouraged and it's kind of like, wait, but I know my stuff. So what is it that you're looking for? So I just, ask for feedback. Like, it's okay to ask for feedback and you have to be okay with what they're going to give you. That's... And you have to be, one, one quick second, um, from an HR perspective, you know, I just want to give people some insight because I hear this so often and I know it can be discouraging, but there are a zillion reasons why, you know, people don't get hired for positions. And I say to people all the time, you cannot take any of it personally any of it because there's so many things that are going on behind the scenes it could have absolutely nothing to do with you you know you could have i'll give you a really good example um we were hiring a couple years ago someone for for my own team and um we had two really seasoned people and we had a candidate come in who was really seasoned as well and we thought about really the personalities of these three people and the two seasoned people were already kind of like butting heads and they they were you know they were very very passionate about what they did and they were also vocal and they were you know they were a lot right so this these two were a lot to deal with and I, I said to my manager, and then we, and then a, another person showed up, and she was um, junior. She had like a little bit of experience, uh, but the personality was more of a better fit for this team. So the other people that came in, they had the credentials. I always say when you are interviewing, the managers see that you have the credentials. Like they don't bring in people that don't have credentials. That's not happening. So on paper, you look like you could be a fit. A lot of the times it has to do with, you know, like the dynamics of the team. Do we want somebody super seasoned because we have junior people? Do we need a junior people because we have too many, you know, we have like a bunch of seasoned people? Do we, does this person seem like they're going to be able to speak up for, against like other people on the team? So there's like so many different dynamics that don't have anything to do with you personally. Um and that's one of the reasons that's a lot of times it's, it's purely personality fit in. Why would you want to change your personality? To, you know, like you wouldn't want to. You only want to be in a place where you're going to be the, the right fit. 
So I tell people all the time, do not feel bad, you know, and, and sometimes the feedback, they can't tell you, oh, you know, you're too quiet and the rest of these people are loud. <laughs> like they can't. And I find it now more than ever in the cyber world, like a lot of these jobs are going through the recruiters. So the recruiters can talk to you and be more personable with you compared to the, you know, the direct, direct interviews. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, and you just never know. So it was, it was in this particular case, the seasoned lady, she had all the experience, everything else. I had, I, I, and it was funny because I was coaching my boss in this case. He, he hadn't managed in a long time or he hadn't recruited in a long time. And I said to him, I said, you know, we should bring in this person. And these are the, th- these are the reasons why. And at the end of that cycle, like when we, when we, when he did my performance review, he's like, wow, you really got it. Like you really understood this whole interview dynamic. I said, yeah, can you imagine if we brought this other person in? Not that that person was was bad she was perfectly capable of doing the job it was just that we had this team and this team dynamic just it just would not have been the right fit you know so it's purely a lot of the times that so go ahead chris i was gonna say one one of the interesting ways that i found to ask for feedback without asking for feedback and putting um individuals in that space is asking the question like based on my background, how would you find a candidate like this? Uh, what sort of challenges might a candidate like myself face in a role like this? So you're asking for um, where they might see challenges. And again, that m- might not necessarily, th- they might not answer it, but if they do, th- that's really what you're asking for. Where are you falling short for you to grow? And if you ask it in a manner like that, it doesn't sound like um, they're giving you feedback. They're just saying, well, this is where I could see that you're struggling. And I don't know if these are the areas that I want to train someone up in or if I can afford having that sort of ramp up time, that kind of thing. So how would you, um, since you mentioned our road on um, <clears throat> the road, the, the road trip, um, the Cyber Nation road trip and your interview process, um, how many different interviews did you do before you were finally able to to find that that first role? Oh, ooh, still after that, 10 to be exact, it was 10. Um, and then even with getting that first role, they took me through seven rounds of interviews. Like I interviewed with seven different people. And then in, in that process, I had to write like cyber reports. I had to demonstrate that I could write a cyber report, that I know how to communicate um, to certain audience and, you know, all this good stuff. So it still took a while. And I'm now I'm starting all over again. <laughs> like I'm doing it all over. So you're actively on the market right now? Yes. You know, it, it's one of those things with cyber because what you learn today, you probably won't use it two weeks from now because something will be upgraded and it will change and then somebody will come with something new. And then sometimes we have to learn that when we get certain roles and we think it's a dream role and you get into a, a year and it's like, oh, wow, I don't I don't like this aspect of cyber. And I think a lot of people fail to realize um, cyber and everything is just not about coding. Everybody does not have to code. It's so many avenues and so many roles that we can go down. I know personally, I take more to the forensics and investigation side of cyber. I love that. Um, I started out that with that role, and then it switched to me being more of a cyber tech writer. I can write, but that's not what I want to wake up and do every day. You know, I love reading cyber articles for myself and sharing them with my friends so we can talk about, like, look how crazy it is. This person didn't secure this, or this person swiped their card and do it, but I can't write every day. I don't want to write two and three page articles every day. So I'm like, I know now that I can apply and it's going to take a while, but I'm going to get that investigation job that I dream, you know? So it's okay to start over. It's okay to wake up one day and realize I don't like this. And it's okay to make changes and prep yourself to go through whatever you need to do to change it. That That is so true. There, There's so many roles. There's so many different aspects. And um, because of that, you also need so many individuals with different backgrounds. Because, uh, for example, as you mentioned, you need writers and people with uh, that have that strong competency of technical writing or to be able to research um, the 
whatever is happening, whether it's a technical incident or maybe just uh, summarize what's happening to be able to, to parse that information and pass it on to the executives in a manner that they understand. But you still have to be uh, technical enough to include that information and not every average writer would be able to do something like that. Um, and the cool thing is that, you know, by going through some of these roles that you don't like, you realize what you really do like, or you realize what you really don't like. So if sometimes I, I also say to people is if you hadn't gone through that, you wouldn't realize like, this is not, this is not my forte. You know, this is not what I, this is not what I want to do. Or, or this is this is something that I absolutely love and I could do it all day long. And if I were, if I wasn't getting paid, I would still be doing it, you know? And that's when you really find out what your true, where your true passion lies. So yeah, do, you know, to your point, do not be afraid to change and switch. And we hear it at people at all levels, you know? Chris and I know some folks that are super seasoned and they said, hmm, this isn't, you know, we don't, you don't like this role, we're switching, we're, you know, we're going to try this. And then some other folks that, again, have been in the, in the field a year, a year and a half, they say the same thing, you know, like, oh, I tried this, this isn't really my forte, I want to try this now. So such great opportunity. I mean, the, the wonderful thing is there's tons of opportunity. Um, and to Chris's point, and to your point, it, there's, there's so many ways that people with various backgrounds can get in and try out new different things. And then uh, one thing I tell people, don't be discouraged of applying for jobs that offer security clearance. I know I've applied for a few myself. I've been through the tedious uh, <laughs> the, uh, clearance forms and, you know, they tell you sometimes it takes a year. So it's just like, OK, so I may wake up a year from now or six months and a job I applied for two years ago for this process that I started may say, hey, we your background clear. Come work. So it's kind of like. <laughs> You just got to be open and you just got to go for it. So, so a question for you. So as you're exploring new roles, as you're looking for uh, new things, how do you keep current? How do you uh, keep your skills live? How do you um, stay up to date with all the changes that are happening? Um, for one, um, Cybrary is, uh, is, it has been my go-to. Um, I always find online courses to just kind of uh, browse up on. Um, me, it sounds weird, but I have mentors in my head and online. Uh, so pretty much what I do is I find them and I'll kind of start seeing what they're doing. And then I'll kind of like here in the DMV, it's a lot of meetups. It's a lot of seminars that people just throw and I'll go and I'll just listen to kind of see what they're doing. And then I grab a book or something and say, hey, let me familiarize myself with this. There's a lot of me personally. I like digital forensic and investigation standpoint. So there's a lot of podcasts that I listen to like in the mornings on the trains or if I'm running or working out to kind of figure out what do I need to know. And then I'll just come home some days and because I like to investigate and it's, I'll just sit there and just see if I can hack and investigate stuff. You know, it's just, it's something I love to do. So it never becomes a, a task that, you know, sometimes we come home and it's just like, ah, oh, let me get online and look at this. It's something I enjoy. It's almost like playing a video game. Yeah. yeah. And that's what that, you know, when you say that, that's what people, those, the managers out there, every single time, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, when I talk to hiring managers, they talk about the passion, right? What are people passionate about? What are they doing on their free, in their free time? What are they, um, what are they focused on? What are they looking to learn? And when you say stuff like that, it excites a manager. They're like, oh my God, you know, um, security is not something you shut down at five o'clock and you go home not, like it's yeah. continuous and i think people fail to realize like every day we wake up from coffee makers to like you just swiping your car security is uh it's your everyday life so it's like i can't turn it off like i don't want to um i find myself time sometimes going to underline all me underground forums and kind of see what everybody's talking about and it's just you will learn so much from strangers that people wouldn't have any idea. So, so regards to uh, some of the local meetups, uh, some of the events that you've been to in the DC area, I know uh, Katie asked in the chat, um, what sort of events would you recommend someone attend to learn more about the cybersecurity field? Um, do you mind sharing some of the ones that you go to? Um, yes, um, so a, a good mentor, um, Tyrone Wilson, he's with Cover 6 Solutions. 
he mm, always I know booked, yes he's always hosting uh meetups out in VA um he does like online stuff that you can plug into uh, I'm a I love volunteering for the B-side conferences for one it gives me a chance to kind of network and meet other cyber professionals two is just because you know when people see you volunteering and they're not always uh you know wanting it's wanting to like Give me, give me. Like I, you have to pay your dues sometimes. Get out there and do the groundwork. Get out there and make your face known. Like nobody knows if you're just sitting behind the keyboard complaining that I can't do this, I can't do this. And thanks to UMUC and Road Trip Nation, like I've been offered to speak at so many events that it keeps me going, keeps my face out there. Um, so definitely, and Meetup. Meetup is a good, it's so many like cyber and networking and IT stuff on Meetup that I get daily. So um, if you, if I'm on LinkedIn or if I'm not friends with you on LinkedIn, please add me. I can share this stuff. I get it every day. Um, I tend to go at least twice a week to just random stuff on Meetup. So um, those are some starting points. Um, and especially check out Cover 6 Solution. Um, Tyrone, I know he usually offer like Jeopardy games and stuff with people he partner with to just help you study for the CISSP and just other um, certifications that's out here for you. Okay, okay. I wanted to answer a quick question. Keith asked if most of the individuals who change careers into cyber jobs from non-tech jobs only, can they only get junior roles in cyber? And I wanted to share with you, Keith, that it definitely is more difficult, we found, to make a transition on a higher level, like when you're, you know, pretty high up in your career to kind of transition over. But it has been done. Um, a few of the people who we interviewed, so last, a couple weeks ago, we had on um, Tracy Mayleaf, and she is a former librarian, and she transitioned over into cyber as an analyst. And I believe it was on par, you know, with the, the level of experience that she had. Antoine, when you moved over from your um, sysadmin job into your security role, did you, um, was it equitable in terms of pay or did you have to take a pay cut? Um, no, I actually took a pay, pay increase, yes. right? Damn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, sometimes it's depending on the role. I mean, if you're already making a, a boatload of money, oops. You're making a ton of money. <laughs> you might have to take a pay cut, um, but from what from what I've learned and from what I've seen, um, most people that have a number of years can usually make a relatively decent transition and either get a pay increase or a lateral in terms of comp. And then, uh, from so, my uh, personal experience yeah, and, as a recruiter, <laughs> and meeting people and even now with uh, just trying to transition and still in the job market and researching, I also find it. If you're within an organization and you find it, it's a role that you kind of want to transfer to, start going to that department. You know, we all have downtime at work. And I know sometimes with cyber, we're not confined to the desk all the time. We have more free time and leisure to kind of roam around. Start networking with those departments. Go and sit down with somebody to kind of learn what they're learning. It, sometimes they make a smooth transition if you just get in good and say, hey, I'm learning this. Or can I come by your desk and sit and watch you? That stuff goes a long ways. So um, I'm going to add this. I'm, I'm going to just piggyback on what you said, because this, I absolutely love like this is what I preach all day long. And then I'll have Chris end up finalizing our, our webinar today because it's, it's 32 minutes after. Um, but you are so absolutely right. Like I am a huge, huge, huge proponent. Like my if you put me on a soapbox somewhere, what I would be shouting day in and out is it is so much easier to transition when you're inside of an organization, especially when these big organizations, Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies that have 600 people in their cyber departments, 200 people in their cyber departments, it's so much easier to transition into those roles than when you're on the outside looking in. So you are absolutely right. Trying to find a friend, lunch and learns, going over saying, hey, can I sit at your desk and find out what you do? Like, I can't imagine any person sitting in an information security department today saying, no, don't no. cover <laughs> over my shoulder. Like, it's just not going to happen, you know? So Antoine, thank you so much. Chris, I know you have your final question. It is 1233, so go for it. Antoine, if you had one piece of sh sage advice that you'd share with someone going through or going through your journey or trying to break in, what would you, what would you share with them? Um, it's okay not to know. 
is um, ask many questions as you can. Find online mentors. Um, you have to be okay with failing sometimes because it's going to happen. Um, even with cyber, you have to be okay with breaking stuff. That's how we learn. Uh, we don't always have the answers and ask questions. <laughs> be curious. Yes, be curious. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you again, Antoine. Thank you so much. Thank you, my fabulous co-host, Chris Folon. Next week, we will have more UMUC grads, um, actually one next Friday and the following Friday to end out the year. And we are so excited to continue on with this Breaking Into Cybersecurity series. Thanks, everyone. Connect with us all on LinkedIn and have a wonderful week. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.